Guys, I've got a really um, interesting show for you today because one of my big concerns in in dogs is the future of dogs and dog sports. The more things that get torn apart in the world, um, the world can get to be a pretty nutty place, but when it affects dogs, I really take it personally. And this is happening a lot. We see it all over the place. We see bands and, 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 and people talking bad things about training and talking bad things about sports. I have two guests on the show today, and it's Florian and Patricia Knobel, who are a top level of the IGP sport, very, very um, accomplished uh, players in the game. But more importantly than that, today we may touch on the IGP, but I want to touch on a couple topics. They've started an organization along with the Sherk, CP Sherk, Peter and Connie Sherk, that is really about protecting sports. Now, in some areas, sports are very viable, but there's a very big divide, and it's animal rights people who are really pushing these issues, and we want to push back a little bit on education. We want to make um, the, the standpoint that what we're doing is what's best for sports. So Florian and Patricia, you started an organization called Canine and Sports, and you started that recently. I know um, you, you guys, like I said, Florian, you're a world champion in IGP, an, an amazing person and an author. Um, the book you and Peter Sherrick wrote is an amazing book, actually two books you wrote, um, Gemeinsam um, Erfolgreich, which means successful together. And you wrote a version for protection and for um, obedience. And I'm waiting for the protection one to come into um, English, although I've read the German version. Um, tell me, uh, guys, what is canine in sports and why, why did you start it and what is it doing really for the future of, of sports? Yeah, I think um, our main goal, it's um, quite easy, but also quite important for us, and it's to preserve um, the working dogs. And I think for that, um, we need not just the dogs in the military or military breeds. Um, we need also the breeders um, which are breeding sport dogs because we have much more breeders um, which are breeding dogs for sport and also military. Therefore, we think it's so important um, to have also the other breeders. So you're saying that the breeders that are breeding dogs for the military are also breeding dogs for the sports? Yeah. Um, we think it's important to have a um, good working dog. And for a good working dog, you need a lot of dogs because otherwise the genetic pool is very soon too small if you have mm -hmm. just a few dogs. And if you compare the numbers um, between the dogs in the sport and the dog which are used at military or the canine dogs, then they are lesser. And, and therefore, um, we need a huge or big genetic pool. And therefore, we need also the breeders which are breeding the dogs for both. So the dogs that end up in the sport, I know this for a fact, I want to kind of explain this. I've had so many guests on the show, we talked about this. The, the dogs that you train that can either be a club dog or a regional dog or a world championship dog, those same bloodlines are what's used for police dogs and military dogs and search and rescue dogs. Am I correct? Um, not entire, entirely, but to the largest part. Um, the, the vast majority of dogs that goes to the police, to the military, to customs, to search and rescue um, organizations, are um, bought uh, with dealers. There are only a few dealers in the world um, that supply these organizations and public authorities with the dogs. And um, most of these dogs come from breeders um, that breed for sport and that breed with sport lines. And so essentially they are the same dogs. There are, there are exceptions. Um, some militaries breed their own dogs, but mm -hmm. this doesn't exist in a large extent worldwide. Yeah. I mean, again, and I think then you go back to this whole issue because I know, for example, the Swedish military has their own breeding program. It's a very good program. But for large capacity things, like the U.S. military, I know, buys a lot of dogs from Germany. That I know for a fact. Um, other countries buy. And the German military is still depending largely on, our, on dogs from your sport, from the IGP sport. Mm -hmm. Right. So by, by yeah. so, so I think we need to look at that because you guys are, first of all, I think it's important to differentiate that, you know, yes, this is an important piece. The dogs from the sports 
do go to the military and stuff like that. But there's also a really important component that these are actually very nice dogs. They're, they're family dogs. They live with friends and families. They're social. They're going to coffee shops and stuff. There was a podcast a while ago where somebody was saying, oh, these dogs are super dangerous. Um, by the way, I've interviewed the very, very top military people in the world on this show, and there's not one person who will tell you that a Schutzen or IGP trained dog will just randomly attack a person. Have you ever seen that? Because Florian, I think you posted something about a study that was done, was it in Bavaria? Yeah, yeah it was in Germany and um, it was a research work and he made his PhD and um, he evaluated the number um, of bites from, and he compared trained dogs, working dogs and pet dogs and he found out that good trained dog or um, also very good um, trained working dogs um, have just a few bites compared to the rest. I think it was, I don't know, 2%, two, two something mm -hmm. like this. So almost nothing. And um, the most bites are from untrained dogs. And if they, yeah, don't um, make, if they do not train the dogs and if they don't, um, spend enough time with the dogs. I think that's very often the reason that a dog then search for new ideas and sometimes yeah. also for bad ideas. Yeah, because in the sport, in the IGP sport, um, and, I, and I know canine sports really encompasses all things. You want people, you're trying to get people to join who are hunters, who are agility people, who are uh, protection dog people, everything. But um, I just want to talk about the IGP sport because I think this is your specialty and it's a three-phase sport. We have tracking, we have obedience, and we have protection. And I think the real controversial part is the protection, obviously, right? Yeah. Why do you think that's so controversial? And dogs naturally, you know, for hundreds of years, people have used dogs to protect property or people. But now mm -hmm. that we've put it into a sport, this is truly, a, the, I think, the ultimate game a dog can play. I mean, you've, you've probably been around more dogs than most people in the world. Why, why do you see that as such a conflict for people um, to see dogs doing what they're naturally bred to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, if you look to, for example, trekking, that looks super nice for everybody. So mm -hmm. you go through grass, through a field, and the dog is searching just the steps. So that's easy to explain. You need it, the police need it, you need it for drugs, for a lot of stuff so you can explain it then obedience for everybody it's clear if you give a command then it's great if a dog is doing the command but mm -hmm. very often we get the question why do you still need protection dog and of course um, the um, situations in the world from country to country are different so for some countries it's very logical that you need a protection dog and um, there is no discussion about it. But in some mm -hmm. countries and also in Germany, um, of course, the people are saying, why do you need a protection dog? And um, but for us, it's um, that we have like a kind of selection. What can a dog do? And um, it is also that um, if you just if you learn of a fight sport, that means not that you are dangerous mm -hmm. and especially in the bite sport, the dog is in a high drive. Um, um, for him, it's a high drive um, situation. And we treat, we train the dog that even in this situation, we can handle the dog, we can steer him if we say out, if we say stop. Um, so that's a very good um, training for the dog. And um, that's the connection to the canine dogs. We have um, kind of working dog and the working dog means that you can use him for a lot of different situations and for the police for example it means also to protect the country to protect people and um, that's the reason why we have a huge overlap with the whole police dog training do you think and i think when you oh go ahead so, please patricia go ahead is it okay to add something yes so when you ask um why are people upset nowadays with protection um i think it's also 
um, a shift that is happening in society. Um, originally, these sports, not only IGP, but also the ring sports developed in order to support the police and the military um, with the education of their dogs and with the breeding. And it was very natural 100 years ago for people because I think they also worked more with animals. You know, if you go out to a farmer today and explain them what you do, they think it's normal because they are used to working with animals. Now, if you go into a city, um, pets are moving into a different direction or the way people live with pets. They are starting to replace children or partners. They're becoming kind of friends to people and are not so much animal animals that also work um, with humans. And that is something that the animal rights activists are also always pointing out. They're kind of making it look like animals are slaves while in re reality they live in some form of symbiosis and it's their part of the job. But I think we've moved away from that a lot from um, the way society acts uh, nowadays. And that's one thing that pulls people away from this sport. Yeah, you say something too that's interesting. I think it's really important to differentiate. We're talking about animal rights and animal welfare. In other words, mm -hmm. animal rights people tend to be the radical fringe. They're very, very, there's few of them, but they're very loud. Um, we're animal welfare people. Everyone, everyone, one of us believes in animal welfare. We want the dog to be healthy and happy and well cared for. And I might add that in sports like IGP, Mondio Ring, Agility, my wife is a, is a very, uh, very fierce agility competitor. Um, I don't think these dogs could be better cared for. I think mm -hmm. these sports really give the, if you're looking at it purely from an animal welfare perspective, then you would really want these sports to be continue because these dogs are being trained, they're being loved, they're being given stimulation, mental and physical stimulation, which a lot of pet dogs never have. They just live in a, in a house and they don't get to express themselves as a working dog does. Yeah, and you mentioned the point, and I think that's a very, very good point. You mentioned, say, a bread for this. And so that's the reason if you look to our dogs, and if you ask us which is their preferred discipline, and the answer is quite clear, that's protection. Because then for them, it's a fight, they love the fight, and yeah, for them, they can spend so much energy, and so they really love it. They also yeah. like the other disciplines, but I think protection, it's the best yeah. for the dogs. You know, I talked to a lady, a, a top-level AKC competitor, obedience competitor, and we were talking because I did AKC with Goofy, and, um, and my wife was doing agility at another event, and she said, you know, Robert, and this is a woman who's been doing obedience for, I would say, 50-plus years. She said, you know, Robert, if a dog had a choice, he would never do obedience. He would do agility, <laughs> and, you know, because they hate obedience. They, they don't want to, you know, I have to get the stupid dumbbell, and in AKC it's worse because it's this <laughs> tiny little ring. But, you know, in protection, I think protection for what, what you're doing, you know, in this sport is similar to agility because they get to run, they get to play, they get to this bite, they get to, you know, engage a person and, mm -hmm. and get their, their stimulation up. Um, what a fun sport for a dog, you know, I mean, that, that IGP is and, and all these, these sports really are. But let's talk, let's touch on canine and sports because um, you started this organization. Now you have several thousand uh, signatures or people already um, supporting the organization, right, from all over the world. Yeah, yeah. We started the initiative um, beginning of this year, and um, yeah, we're also super happy that we have now um, over six thousand supporters and. Um, what you mentioned, um, the, our goal is to preserve really the working dog and the working dog breeds. And um, therefore, we tried to connect different dog handlers, breeders, canine trainers from different countries and um, not, just, um, not just canine police dogs, also search and rescue dogs. So a lot of different um, disciplines and um, we try to have a huge community all over the world. Um, all the people who are loving the breeds, who are loving um, the, not, not just the sport, it's mm -hmm. all about the breed, if you ask us, because you need the breed to um, for, for different sports or for different reasons. And yeah. it doesn't matter if you need at the end a police dog or if you need a um, search and rescue dog. Um, or also agility. For agility, you need also stable dogs because 
um, all the devices are a little bit shaky and not super stable and yes mm. that's some requirements which a dog has to fulfill and it doesn't matter if it is a search and rescue dog or other dog and therefore uh, we said we try to bring the people together from different countries different breeds also um, mm -hmm. not just malinos so we have um, people from the doberman from the rottweiler from um, of course malinois german shepherd riesen schnauzer so um, all people who are having the mindset that we have to keep the level high of the working dogs because um, we see that um, you have really to take care that a breed keeps healthy we yeah. saw it um, in the past with the hips for example we didn't care about the hips um, for example in the sv um, now they changed it but it's not just the health it's also the capability of the dog so that means the drives and therefore we have to test them and we have to keep the level higher mm -hmm. and so when people want to get involved because i think it in any capacity i think people should be involved in something that protects the sport i mean i've been a member of the usca i've been a member of the mondio ring association uh, mondio um by the u.s malinois association and even though i'm not competing i still donate i still keep my dues active i still donate to trials and stuff like that. Because even though I'm not competing right now, I think we need to preserve the sport we love. And I think Canine Sports gives people that opportunity. You're asking people just to sign up to put their signature or their name to a list. Is there any fees or dues or anything at this point that you're charging for people to be a member of Canine and Sports? No, there's um, no obligations connected. Um, this, as Florian said, is a very, um, young interest um, or group mm -hmm. and um, we are just finding the way how to get it organized in the best way but the signature list that you mentioned is merely to create this community to hook up people that have the same interest to show on the outside that there is a critical mass that is interested in working dogs and um, on the other hand, we have what we call the ambassadors. Um, we have people who are actively working together in working groups on various topics. And um, if somebody's interested in doing something actively, um, then they should just contact us via email. Okay, so I'm going to put a link in the description down below so people can find your website and sign up and become members of this and they can be any country it can be any sport it can be any dog sport or you know anything they want they can just kind of say I, I want to support this and i think this is an important piece because by putting your name on a list it shows that we have five thousand we have ten thousand we have a hundred thousand people who believe in this that we will fight for keeping and we we're, your goal too is to unite right it's not just igp or just mondio ring it's it's all dog lovers who should unite because if they come for one sport they're going to come for all the sports mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point very often the people ask us yeah but i don't train or i don't compete with my dog so can I be part um, of this or part of the list? And we said, yeah, of course, because um, everybody who likes or who loves dogs and who think that we need as um, we need um, working dogs, um, then please sign. And um, it's great if you support it because um, we try to get as many signings as possible because. Um, for us, it's better if we have a list with a lot of supporters because then we can talk to the governance and we can talk to different um, associations. And of course, it's better if you have a lot of supporters on the list because then they are seeing we are not just a few people and fighting for it. So a lot of people think that we need these kind of sport talks or not just sport talks, that we need this kind of dogs. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, any dog, you know, people who don't do an activity with their dog, they're, they're very nice people, obviously, but they're really not fulfilling the dog's needs. And it's kind of like with a child, you kind of talked about, and it's, it's a topic very close to my heart, martial arts. You know, if we teach our children martial arts, boxing, bok karate, jujitsu or anything, there, it builds a strong character in them. And also those those kids are the rare ones that get in fights in school or in the schoolyard yeah. or, or, you know, wherever. Th this is why our dogs, and I, I can tell you, Goofy had the basic beginnings. Goofy has never been in a fight in his life. And people I know that have protection dogs, 
it's the rarest dogs that you ever see either getting in a dog fight or biting somebody else because they're trained. They're not trained how to bite. They're trained how to control the bite. And that's important because all dogs naturally know how to bite. They already have that skill. So when somebody says that this is teaching them that skill, it's not. The biting is, the, is an ingrained skill for a dog. This IGP teaches dogs really how to control that drive, how to harness it, how to use it, and how to control it through a person. Like you're telling your dog, okay, you can go bite that guy. Mm -hmm. And you're yeah. only biting him when he has a sleeve on anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, what you're saying, is I think it's a very good point. Um, we don't make the dog aggressive or we don't... Um, yeah, bring the dog in a situation where he has to fight for his life. Um, so for our dogs, it's um, it's a it's a not a it's not just a game, but it's something out of the drives. We use the drive of a dog, but he has a drive. So he comes to the world with a set of different drives, and though we just use him. And um, as you mentioned, if you throw a ball, then he bites in the ball because right. he has a prey drive. And um, you, you, do, you don't have to teach him that because it's a drive and he's born with this drive. And we use this drive, but we train the dog also that we can control him, even is he, if he's in a high drive uh, mood. And I think that's the most important thing. And if we look to our club, then we had never a bite um, outside um, in normal life. Um, they, of course, biting in the sport, but it's just like a boxer. If he enters the ring, then he's fighting. But outside, um, he can be, in, or very often, they are the very social people. Yeah. And um, we are comparing it also with um, Glitchko. He knows what he can, but that means not um, if he's the best fighter, that he's the most dangerous pe person in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important. You know, in your book, um, Gemeinsam Erfolgreich, um, where you talk about protection, um, you have a really, your, your, your club, Team Hoivinkel, I mean, is, is probably the, the, the number one protection uh, igp team in the world right I, I think you guys have won the world championships and everything more than anybody isn't that true yeah i think that's okay. true yeah okay you're very modest <laughs> because i read it the back <laughs> of your book. it's pretty amazing um yeah no you you guys are really amazing and and i know a lot of really good trainers so when i when i say this to you i, I mean it with with a lot of respect and, and admiration you teach the protection and, and you say this that this whole idea when you start with a puppy, um, and I, you don't even use the word like defensive aggression because that's a, it's an old school term that was used to teach dogs protection. You, you have this other, and I don't want to give away the secret to your book, as I think everybody should buy it, but you really limit this game of teaching this behavior of biting, of barking, of becoming dominant. You limit it to the protection field. Right? In other words, you mm -hmm. only show the dog that picture when there are blinds set up and when it's in that context. Yeah. So there can, there can be no mistake because your dogs, and when I talk to Peter, your, your, um, your, your, the guru, right? the, <laughs> the, 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 the maestro, um, he talked a lot about how social your dogs really are. I mean, last time we talked, your dog was crawling up in your lap, and I'm sure, and you have a young child. Your dog probably plays with your young child. You don't have any danger yeah. worrying about, oh my God, can I leave my dog with my child? Um, I think this is an important thing we need to get people to really understand too. And I mean, all your people, I mean, Stephanie was just at the the, the big championships and, and Peter and Connie are there constantly. You guys are there constantly. Um, how can we get people in the outside, right? People who aren't fans of IGP to see this more because it's it's hard to find, Right, it's a small community. Well, I think one factor is um, uniting this world because um, the world is not that big, but in reality, it's international, it's worldwide, it covers many breeds. And if you bring the people together that work in these kind of sports that have various breeds, you have a much more, a much bigger mass. If they um, cooperate, work together, speak out together, there's already more that can be seen. And um, in canine and sports, we said we have uh, various working groups. One of them uh, covers public relations and it doesn't, what, we, what we're not looking to do is um, explain things to dog sport lovers. They already know everything, they're already on our side. So that's not what we are trying to do. We are trying to find ways 
um, to explain the sport, to explain what working dogs can do. We do a lot of interviews with very interesting people. For example, um, search and rescue handlers that just came back from Turkey from the earthquake um, and also um, do the sport. We talk to um, people from the military who are um, canine handlers and do dog sport at the same time. We try to um, explain the whole world that is actually behind this little sport that you see. And it's an historical thing. It's a sport that has a long history and the history really was around working dogs. And that's what we are trying to do on the one hand. Um, and one other thing that we are trying to do is target competitions. Um, because if you look at, for example, soccer, ice hockey, if a competition is there, a good one, um, then people will come, they will watch, um, they get involved, Not, but they don't necessarily are active in the sport. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, to a certain degree, this is easier with sports like soccer. You, it's, it's kind of easy to watch goal, no goal, and you can get involved more easily than in the tidy obedience rankings. Um, mm -hmm. But we do believe that there is interest to it. Uh, for example, we did a um, camp for IGP um, for young people in 2022. And uh, the local newspaper came, people came by that just knew there was a camp around dogs and they were standing there watching, talking to the people, asking what we were doing and why. And um, I think there is um, more that could be brought to the people, more explanation, more involvement, um, these kind of things. Oh, I want to talk more about that in one second, the young stars. But in a, in a, for a quick second, I was just when you said something kind of struck a, a note in me. Uh, many many years ago there was a horse show here in in uh, in mm -hmm. the valley and in, in, in la and the women the woman who's, who ran the horse shows is a good friend of mine she said hey can you come do a demonstration with your dog goofy and i just went there and it showed people who were into horses what people can do with dogs and that's mm -hmm. not really a bad idea for you know you guys mm -hmm. have so many different events like you know soccer is such a huge sport for a foosball in germany in europe to get to those events and to have, you know, before the, 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 tr the trial or in the halftime to do a demonstration, to show people a little, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be the whole thing, but more people who see the control and the elegance and the beauty, even the beauty in watching something like, uh, you know, a transport with a, with a person or, you know, or an escape bite or anything, the mm -hmm. control and everything that goes with it. It's not just this, you know, um, crashing and, and biting thing it's actually completely controlled and um that's not a bad idea but the more people you could get at an event and insert yourself into that or the more public people you could get to come watch especially in europe because these here the sports you know the, unless you have a, a, a national championship they're not really that popular um it would be hard to get an audience i i rarely see if i go to a trial it's rare that i see more than five or six people and they're usually related to somebody in the trial mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's out. a great idea. combining yeah. it with other sports is, is a very good idea that we should discuss further. Yeah, just that's a, that's a freebie. Um, I want to talk about young stars because I think this sport, when I first got into it 15 years ago or so, when I first started looking into it, um, was a dying sport. It, the sport really was just full of 60, 70 year old guys who, um, you know, used old methods in training and they could barely walk around. You know, I mean, you know, they, they were taking the bite and basically, and, and there's a guy, Dave Reaver, who's uh, the son of uh, uh, Mike, the father of Mike Reaver, who's a legend. But this guy's 84 years old and he still does, he still takes a bite. He does all the police and military dogs. But I'm seeing now so many younger kids wanting to learn the sport. Tell me about young stars because it's an amazing program that you guys are doing with kids for the sports yeah i think um the producer mentioned already igp youngsters um that was our idea and i think we started 21 with the idea mm -hmm. something like this and um, then we said um, we have to set up something for the sport for the igp sport because here in germany um, it is the same that if you look to the average age, then it is quite high. And uh, we see that there are two less people, two less young people. And mm. um, very often we hear also yeah, in the sport, there are no young people. And then we decided, yeah, let's do a, um, a youngster camp. That means give them the possibility to train with top um, trainers um, for, for free. 
so we don't um, charge anything and we invited 20 top handlers and um, from not just Germany also from Italy and other countries so we had um, these 20 top trainers and then um, we asked the VDH that's the head organization of Germany mm -hmm. um, and we explained our idea and we said yeah we want to set up this camp for 100 young people and um, <laughs> um, I said to Patricia, oh, it could be that it's a, a little bit a high goal to get 100 young people. And um, then the VDH said, yeah, um, they will support us. And also the DMC, we asked the DMC and they also told us they will support us. And then we made a homepage and we put that event online. And it was for us unbelievable. I will never forget it. Um, we put it online and then we went to a restaurant and we came back one and a half hours later and the formula what, which they have to fill out was really long with um, a lot of questions and signing from the parents and all that stuff and after one and a half hours we had about 40 registrations and 24 hours later we have to um, to put it on offline again because we had 150 registration within 24 hours it's yeah that was unbelievable for us and what did they learn in the camp like what 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 happened what, what, tell me a little bit about the the youngsters camp um we ended up we expanded the camp and we ended ha having um, 160 young people um all younger than 25 and i think the youngest participant was actually five <laughs> and a certain amount, I think 50 to 60 people um, attended in working spots. That means they had their dog with them. And we divided the whole group of young people into four different groups. Um, one was, um, we, we named them after the Avengers. The youngest mm -hmm. one was, what was what were they called? Rocket yeah. Raccoon. Rocket Raccoon. Um, they were all younger than 12. Um, then we had two regular groups and we had the helper camp um, because even more surprisingly, we had so many people writing us and asking if they could have specifically helper training that we decided to, sp to set up a young people helper training also. And um, we had a pretty big field, which we divided into four training fields. And they all had a program throughout the day that between um, obedience and protection work, the helpers obviously had helper training. And also we had um, tracking groups um, that people could separate to and go out and go out with really the greatest guys in tracking. Um, and in addition, we had physiotherapists there. We had the German military. Um, attended um, the police was there um, we had veterinarians and they all had little stands or booths where they would have um, one hour information sessions and things like that um, so it was an entire camp with a program from early in the morning until late at night and we figured that in particular young people would be pretty exhausted after such a program and we said we would end at 7 p.m and then all go to dinner together and the young people were all standing there and even the seven year old saying, can we extend this because I still need to go tracking and it was raining and we wow. were just standing there. Really? You, you don't want to go for dinner? No, no, I need to go tracking. I want to go tracking one more, one more time. And um, yeah, it was an amazing experience for us because they were all extremely motivated. Um, we were a little bit afraid of so many young people and that maybe some form of trouble could come up, but nothing mm -hmm. happened, no bite mm -hmm. incidents, no right. issues <laughs> with any young people. Mm -hmm. um, it really, everybody was super motivated. And we had one evening that we expected to last for very late and um, the mood was good and people were dancing and everything. But quite a few left pretty early and they said, excuse me, this is wonderful, but I need to get to bed because I need to be fit tomorrow morning. I can't stay here till 2 a.m. Uh, so for, for the second I, youngsters, you had yes. youngsters yeah. the next day. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. yeah, so motivation was high and it was, I think, a great experience for the instructors and um, the attendants alike. And I think one thing that is not very typical, but that nowadays is very important, a lot of this was set up in social media. And we set up Instagram and Facebook accounts and all these young people are still very active. They're posting and posting pictures from that time. Um, they email, they ask when the next camp is coming up. So I think it's also a little bit of a more modern setting, which makes it easier for young people to connect. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, our goal um, was to um, give young people the possibility to train with top trainers. I think very often you're in a club and so you're in a small environment and a lot of people that don't have the chance to train with other trainers. And therefore we said, just make it free. And um, so they have the chance, but also the chance to connect to other young people. Um, that was the reason why we made an, an homepage where, where they can connect or um, to use Instagram or Facebook so um, they can they have the chance to get to know each other so they can connect because they're on the, uh, more or less on the same age and I think it's also very good if you have the chance to meet people in the same age or um, with the same interests and yeah, yeah that was also a goal and, and the I think um, also a good point at the seminar was that we have different trainers with different training methods um, mm. because very often um, some people are saying or believing that there is one way and that's the best and we don't agree with this. In Germany we have a saying many roads lead to Rome mm. and I think um, that's true that you have so many roads um, which you can drive to Rome and in Germany, we have so, not just in Germany, in the world, there are so many super good dog trainers with different approaches, but in the end, they show super good performance. And um, so they show a very happy dog who is doing um, what we are asking from the dog. And um, so very often you see that um, somebody is training in a small group with a small idea. And so it's super good if you have the chance to see something else, a, a different kind of training to get mm -hmm. some new ideas and to open your eyes. And I think that was a good approach. So you were able to take kids who were interested in dogs and they were able to do protection and, and, um, and like take bites on a sleeve and do tracking and learn some obedience tips from you guys. I mean, that's a pretty amazing gift right there to work with world champions, the best in the world. And you're just kind of learning the sport, isn't it? Yeah, and we have, uh, I don't know how many, I think there are, we had, I don't know, 12 world champion titles, I think, uh, because we had, for example, Dennis Bernsey, he was four-time world champion with the Riesenschnauzer, Peter Scherk, Steffi Ollmann, and um, then Yogi Zank, and um, so a lot of talk trainers, so the list is very, very long, mm. and... Um, what I want to say is, for example, like Yogi Zank, he has a, li a little different approach than our mm -hmm. training is, but he's super, super successful. He himself sure. and also he with his training group. And for some people, if they train like um, in, in one way, um, one idea, it's good to have the chance to see other ideas. And yeah. um, therefore, we tried also to show the young people all three disciplines. So we had some dogs uh, with a poodle and uh, um, I don't know, was it a mops or a very small one? Yeah, we had a Spitz and we had a Border Collie who um, and, and the girl that um, attended with her Border Collie, she's uh, normally in agility, but she now switched to club. And this is a very nice story. Mm -hmm. She does both now. She does yeah. agility and IGP with her Border Collie. Oh, and right. um, yeah. <laughs> and she made uh, the first steps um, with the Border Collie in protection and she had so much fun. And uh, the nice part is that she wrote us back um, that she sees now that her, her border collie is more and more self-confident mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he started the chasing the helper game. So the dogs mm -hmm. are, oh, um, um, he is running away from me because I'm barking. And so mm -hmm. the dog becomes more and more stable and she likes that idea so much. So he's, she's training now both <laughs> IGP what? and agility. Such an interesting thing. I just thought of this. You know, if, if animal people, people let, let's just forget animal welfare, animal rights, but let's just look at people who love animals. If they really care about animals, and this is an opportunity for young children, which is the number one target you want, to learn to love animals more and to train them and yep. to understand them. I mean, isn't that really the goal? Like, it, it, this is the movement that they're really trying to get, and they're not doing it. They're just trying to shut things down. You are here really making this movement happen, like getting people to understand, training with them, working with them, touching them, getting to understand how to work with them and how to be safe. Yeah, and um, 
we think also it's so important to give um, the young people the chance to do something with their dog. So that means mm -hmm. not just your walk your dog, so train your dog, um, mm -hmm. understand your dog, do something with him. And um, we see very often the young people are sitting more and more in front of a laptop or mm -hmm. um, iPad, whatever, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, they're not outside. Um, they're not, um, yeah, it's, it's a super interaction because mm -hmm. the dog need all your attention in that moment. And the, that's focus you as a dog handler totally to the dog so that the dog can focus on you. So it's both. It's a, it's a connection between both in a good training. And um, yeah, we see that it's so important also for young people. I mean, the greatest gift you can give a young child is a, is a pet, right? Is a dog because they care for it, they bond with it, they love it, it teaches them compassion, it teaches them responsibility. But then also the greatest gift you can give that child and that dog is what they can do together and really accomplish something great, like a title, like maybe putting an IGP-1 on a dog, even if it's just a 1, or even if it's just a BH, something mm -hmm. that they aspire to do, that they can do, and a BH you could do with, with, you know, with a duckel, with a mini schnauzer, uh, with a mini, yeah. mini uh, dachshund, you yeah. know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this, the young stars thing is really the future because at least we know the sport will continue and it will continue in a humane way because the, all the top people who are, tr who are competing now that I'm, I'm talking to really have this philosophy that you talk about in your book about, um, positive associations with training. Yes, there are corrections, but they're really based on, um, fairness and, and interaction and, and teaching dogs and luring and shaping and getting them to understand things. Um, and making the dog have a much better life than it would have if it was just sitting on a couch watching Oprah Winfrey every day, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think um, very often some people, they don't know what a dog can do because mm -hmm. um, very often you see it, um, if you know a police dog or if you know a very good trained dog, then you know what a dog can do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, they have no idea what a dog can do. and. Um, I know it because we had never a dog in our family and um, my brother gave me a dog just as a present and I never asked for a dog, but he came at home <laughs> and said, yeah, that's your dog. And he gave me one dog and I said, oh, I was 13 years old. And then um, I thought, now I have to train my dog. I had no idea about dogs. And um, then I had great luck because then I saw um, dog training field and, and I saw trained dogs. And there was um, a young lady with a reason schnauzer and she was and she was doing free healing uh -huh. and the dog was um, walking next to the handler without a leash and that was for me <laughs> unbelievable that the right. dog is not running away <laughs> yeah yeah Florian, and, what kind of dog she, was it that, that you got for from your brother it was a german shepherd Oh, okay. It's in Germany. It had to be, right? It would have been a pit bull. Yeah, it was now, right? <laughs> yeah the, so, the background was um, my parents they had a restaurant and um, there was a, what, what do you call it if somebody tries to break in? A thief. A, thief? a burglar? Yeah. Burglar thief, yeah. Yeah, um, they, they tried to break in the restaurant and um, then my brother um, had a great idea um, let's buy a dog so the uh, dog can <laughs> protect the restaurant and everything should be good. And then we had the dog. <laughs> but um, what was course, his name? What was the dog's name? It was, um, yeah, the, the whole story is um, that first he bought a dog and um, that was the name of the dog was Cora. That was also German Shepherd. Uh -huh. And um, in the beginning, I had totally fear of dogs. So if a dog came, <laughs> um, I changed the road. Um, even it was a small dog and then I said no it's not a good idea because I have fear of dogs and then my mom said no no don't um, you will see um, after a while you have no fear and um, <laughs> 10 months later um, my brother came home with a second dog and then he gave me the leash and that now oh, that's your dog because I saw you have fun with the dog because it was a, a German um, shepherd puppy and of course, from day to day, um, I was more and more interested in his female. And mm -hmm. after 10 months, um, he came back with a second dog. And that was my first dog. It was a German Shepherd and his name was Eiko. Eiko. Yeah. And did, is, that, is that when you joined Hoiwinkel? No, um, I was 13 years old. 
And um, then I came to a dog training field um, about 10 kilometers away from my home. Mm -hmm. And um, I started there and then I saw the um, recent schnauzer and then I decided I want that my dog also can make free healing without the leash or free healing and um, that he can bring a dumbbell and all that stuff because it was unbelievable for me that a dog can do it. And right. then I started in the club and I started to compete. And at the first competitions, I met the guys from Heuwinkel. And then mm -hmm. I saw, wow, that's a whole team and they're training in a very good way. And then mm -hmm. I was talking to Robert Eder and Peter Scherk. And um, then with 17 years, I came to Heuwinkel wow. a few years later. That's pretty amazing, huh? That's, you, 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 fell in, you fell in the luck there, right? You could have ended up at a really bad club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you ended of up at course. a great club. Yeah. Yeah. I, I started in a club we had no helper. So um, it was quite hard <laughs> to start <laughs> there. We had, I don't know, um, every second week, perhaps one um, training was on helper. And then I saw the guys from Heuwinkel and then I was talking to Sam and um, I was 17 years and then they supported me. And um, then I get my second German Shepherd and um, yeah, with this dog, I trained from the beginning up um, in Heuwinkel. Wow. And that's the, that's history right there from there. It was just always Heuwinkel. And then, then yeah. after that dog, you switched to Malinois? Yeah. Um, the first German Shepherd um, that was from a show line. So he was unfortunately not super healthy. So I have mm -hmm. to stop with him at um, when I was 17 years and then um, I discussed with my parents that I want a second dog and they said no um, you have to finish your school and then you um, are going to study so it's not the time for a second dog and um, but I was discussing and discussing and discussing <laughs> and then we found a solution uh -huh. and um, but I had fear that I have again a dog with bad hips Mm -hmm. And therefore, I tried to buy um, a German Shepherd, which is at least one year old. Mm -hmm. And then was searching for months. I don't know how long, but very long. And um, then I found one and um, he was one and a half years. And yeah, the reason was he was a little bit um, handler aggressive. And um, but he sold the dog because I had not so much money. So I was searching a good dog and cheap dog, and that's very seldom. <laughs> and yeah, that was the story to my next dog. Uh -huh. Wow, this is pretty amazing. A, a, a guy who is afraid of dogs ends up with a dog, and your next dog you get is a dog that was handler aggressive, and you trained the dog. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I think that I think that the, the helper work really um, helped me um, to. Yeah, to lose the, the fear of the dogs because, of course. of course, the first time I was in a trouser and the dog was barking to me, I said, oh my God, what I'm doing <laughs> here, that was not a good idea. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, you, I think um, you learn to read the dog, to understand the dog and as helper, you have to understand the dog so good because you have to be like a sparing partner. So you, mm -hmm. you have to know, is he now stable, is he unstable? And yeah, that was the reason why I had no fear. And he said, yeah, but um, he's selling the dog because he bit him twice. And um, I said, yeah, but I think I will handle it and I can handle it. And this because, uh, and of course, with the help of the other people from mm -hmm. Heuwinkel, they helped me to train the dog and to regulate him. And in the end, he was a super, super social dog. He was unbelievable good and cool and he was living in our house and it was never a bite accident. Um, he had just to learn rules and yeah. after he accepted the rules, he was a super, super good dog. That's fantastic. That's a great, that's a fantastic. And now you, um, as I just found out uh, over our several conversations we've had, which have been really interesting to me, you are a, a Kurmeister for, for the Belgian mm -hmm. Malinois, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that, because I want to kind of go into the third part of our conversation, which is the future of these dogs. Now, as a Kurmeister, you determine which dogs can and can't be bred and the genetic lines of what these offsprings will produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's one of our motivations why, why we are doing uh, <laughs> stuff like the youngster camp um, canine and sports and also 
um, why I'm doing the Quer Meister is um, we want to do all what we can to hold the level of the dogs at the high level. Um, yeah. um, very often in Germany we hear, yeah, the Malinois is not the Malinois from the past. In the past he was quite better. But if mm -hmm. you look to our dogs and um, now Kafka is lie, laying uh, under the table and sleeping, so he's at home a super relaxed dog. Mm -hmm. But on the training field, he's a super, super motivated dog. And um, of course, um, it's not easy to hold um, a level at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And um, at a, as a Quermeister, we are defining or we are judging the dog in different capabilities. So we make like a test and we see how is the prey drive? How is the grip? Is it a dominant dog? Yes or no? Um, um, is he a self-motivated dog? Is he a social dog? All that stuff. We have, I don't know, 11 numbers. Mm, I think 10. 10, 10 numbers pl plus, how do you call the Grundwesen? Um, it's kind of the... Baseline. Yeah. Like the yeah. baseline? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a word um, that means how he, he's erecting in a situation where he feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and um, we we set up a test where we see the dog um, in a non-trained situation. Mm -hmm. um, we non-trained, it's quite hard because of course you can train a lot, but we try that the parkour. Um, is not is, is always different. So um, we set it up um, always in a new way and we try to have new ideas so that we can see the nature of a dog because mm -hmm. um, a dog for the breeding you need a, a dog with a good nature, a good genetic dog and mm -hmm. um, you said um, training, you add training to a dog but um, mm -hmm. for breeding the genetic um, pool is important and therefore we try to really see it and um, then we have like numbers from zero to ten mm -hmm. and um, you need at least a four to pass the, the ZTP or Quero mm -hmm. and um, you can reach till ten as the best number and um, yeah the motivation is um, to and, and I like the ZTP and Quero because for me it's the most interesting event yeah. because um, Patricia made a few weeks ago the ZTP the first time um, uh, for her that she participated at the ZTP and um, that's super interesting because you are in a new situation you start with measuring the dog sometimes mm -hmm. we measure it um, on the field sometimes we measure the dog on the table sometimes um, yeah so we have a lot of different situations and then you start like a whole program measuring, playing, and then out of this, in the end, a protection. And so it's like a chain. And if you have stress in the game, or if it, if it is for the dog a little bit too much, then it comes more and more a problem for him. And in the end, of course, um, some dogs, they really have big problems in the parkour. And so you, in, compared to a, just a normal trial, you can predict each step because you know blind searching, barking, short escape. Mm -hmm. So it's a program with rules. And um, the rule is not so strict at the ZTP and Querung. And the reason is um, to see the nature of the dog and not the training of the dog. So let me and ask I you some questions. One, oh, go ahead, Patricia, please. I got some questions. One really interesting aspect for me, since I'm not a chief, but more a beginner in this whole sport, mm -hmm. is um, that there is a certain amount of dogs that don't pass the breeding selection test, ZDP and Kürung, I think around 20% um, mm -hmm. more yeah. or less don't pass. And they pass for good re don't pass for good reasons, um, very important reasons, for example, that they're not bulletproof. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they show that fear and um, get anxious, run away when um, somebody's shooting. That is something that I think is easy to imagine for everyone. You can't have that in a working dog because yeah. not only will the dog react to um, somebody shooting, but also in an earthquake situation, if something mm -hmm. falls down, if there's a firework. Um, so these dogs really shouldn't continue to be in the breeding. But then you still have 80% that pass, but the information that these tests give you is a very detailed information. Um, Florian said there's a grading um, of 10 different elements 
And the grading is not so much good or bad, but it really describes the dog, mm-hmm. the nature of the dog. And that's important for the breeders when they choose the right partner for the dog they want to use. They can balance things out. Um, they can balance out a weakness they have in one dog, then they take a little more of that aspect in the other dog. So the outcome um, I find very interesting. What age do you do the, the uh, ZD, CTP? Um, you can, um, I, I think the youngest is 15 months, if I'm right. 15 months. Okay, so then... Yeah. If the if the dog gets a four or higher, four to ten on on the CTP, um, that goes under the DMC, right? The German Malinois Club. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then they yeah. that dog can be Good bred. Point, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. We want to make yeah. sure that we get that in there. because yeah. um, the uh, SV has its own Kurmeisters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's um, a completely different program. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I'm. I'm not interested. I'm interested in yours. Um. So. So the dog gets a, a, a five or six or an eight or a nine. Then that dog can be bred to another dog because they get a certificate that says this dog has a, a ZTP of of whatever the score is, and you want to get the highest score, the most information to to breed the yeah. two best dogs together, right? Yeah. And I think um, we started with this idea many, many years ago. Uh, ago. Um, at the moment, um, we were not able to do the next step because um, the idea of the system is, for example, if you have a dog and um, you give him for the grips a seven, that means mm-hmm. a seven means quite good grips, mm-hmm. but not super good grips. Right. Sometimes, um, and in our opinion, uh, the grip of a dog is also a genetic thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and very often we see that um, you destroy your grips because of a bad training for the out or other um, things. So you don't see really in that test the genetic of the grip because it's... Um, I don't know how to say it. It's like covered or um, mm-hmm. covered Asked. from other problems. Yeah. Um, for example, from a bad training. So the dog, um, perhaps he has genetic wise a good grip, but because of bad training, he can't show it anymore. It was really and the bad. idea is, but um, at the moment we don't use that, is um, to evaluate the puppies of a dog. That mm. means if you have a male and, and then after a while, if we have the puppies in the CTP and if you see that this male brings a lot of dogs with super good grips, mm-hmm. then the idea is that this dog can increase his number, for example, from seven to eight, because that would regul- so that means the puppies would regulate all of the numbers of the male of, of the female. And I think that's a very good information for the breeder if we use it. But at the moment, we are not at this point that perhaps it's our next step or I hope that's the next step because um, at, the, at the test, you have one moment of the dog. So you see him sure. about 30 minutes on the field and that's yeah. it. And um, But we don't know. And for example, a good dog means not that he brings good puppies. That's also right. not connected, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, sometimes you have a medium dog and he brings super good dogs and super good dog brings not good dogs. So, mm-hmm. um, but for the breeders, it would be important to use this dog, which bring good puppies. And therefore the idea is that the puppies can influence the numbers of the, of the dog, of the male or of the female. And I think if we introduce this, it would be super, super helpful. Is, is it in Germany? I know people in Germany are more likely to follow rules than in America. Um, so if some, if, I mean, I, I think that it's, 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 it's logical. Like if here people backyard breed dogs all the time, I don't know if you have that in Germany, but um, the DMC pretty much kind of regulates the breeding of the Malinois in Germany, or is it a lot of people just breeding backyard dogs too? Now, if you want the DMC papers, um, then of course you have to fulfill um, requirements. Then you need mm-hmm. some um, genetic tests mm-hmm. and um, you need um, a CTP or a curum, mm-hmm. and you need a show. And, and to get, so, and, but if somebody right. buys a, but if somebody buys a puppy, then you would look for the CDP of the, of the parents Right. And then, but you couldn't do any kind of a curing on the, on the pup, but you could do a curing on the puppy, right? You could look to see what the, the temperament is of the puppy. Yeah. yeah. 
So that's a really valuable tool for people to look for when they're going to buy a Malinois. I don't know if I get the, the question. In other words, I, if I was going to buy a puppy, I would want to make sure the parents are DMC registered and that they have a curung, that they have a, a certificate, mm -hmm. right? And then the puppy, I would you you could do some behavior testing on it to see what is what the temperament is of the dog on the puppy, but they couldn't have the certificate until they were what you said, fifteen months old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you look at the parents and what outcomes they they have, mm -hmm. and then you do separate puppy testing on seven week old um, puppies um, to Got see it. that individual puppy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, aggression yeah. a lot of times does run in genetics. If it's a bad, poorly wired dog, you see genetics run all the way through the line. I've seen that mm -hmm. in, in yeah. German Shepherds out here it's quite a bit. So yeah. with pushing this into the, the canine in sports, this is another portion of what your belief is that this is more important that people understand the genetics of the dog, the breedings of the dogs, and, and something like the DMC or the SV with the German Shepherd or the, the Schnauzer um, certifications. All these pieces work together to continue to breed really nice dogs. Yeah. Yeah, and there's one uh, also very important piece um, in this is to mm -hmm. have the discussion about the breeding selection um, within the um, kennel clubs, but also together with the police and the military and customs with the canine handlers um, who actually can say how they test their dogs, what their requirements are in, in an everyday situation, because of course this shouldn't only be um, sport oriented. And right. that's something um, that is being done in canine and sports currently in a separate working group. There's a lot of discussion um, with um, administrators of canine programs worldwide um, about elements that may be missing or that um, things that could be substituted in these breeding selection tests. And I think there have been some interesting first ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, super good ideas. And for example, what Patricia mentioned is a super good point because um, we had a lot of discussions with some people. Um, they are buying the dogs for police or military or um, to, um, customs. And they told us um, they have a lot of dogs. They are playing super, super good on a field, mm -hmm. but they don't play on slippery floors. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy who mentioned this, um, he is working on ships, he's in working in Hamburg. And um, of course, it's just metal and very slippery for the dog. And a lot of dogs have issues with this. And for example, in our DMC um, CTP or Curum, we don't test it at the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, if we are thinking about why do we um, breed these dogs is, as mentioned, they are working dogs. And working dogs means that they can work on grass, they can work, but also on slippery floors, um, but we never tested it. And um, so we started the first discussions with these guys and, and um, now we have the chance to work on the DMC, Körung and ZTP. So we said that would be super important to add these elements because mm -hmm. we don't want to breed a, a special dog just for IGP. We right. want to breed a dog which you can use for a lot of things. And mm -hmm. therefore, let's add stuff like this to the breeding test to see if a dog has a problem or not, for example, with a slippery floor. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a common thing. I mean, you see dogs have issues with slippery floors all the time. It's, it's, a very big, it's also something that they're not exposed to early on, but you're, you're looking at it from the side of the genetics, the nerves of the dog, if they're willing to work through that more, right? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I mean, it's a great partnership. I mean, this uh, with canine and sports to have dogs that are already cut out for a sport like, you know, IGP or, or whatever it is, you know, Mondio ring or French ring or whatever, they already have a baseline. So you already know that they're genetically not like you said, the Malinois now are not as good as the ones that used to be. I mean, the only thing I see is a lot of times you see Malinois that are poorly bred that have just really thin nerves. I think that's the biggest issue I mm -hmm. see with Malinois uh, through and through. But the dogs that you're talking about, like your dog Kafka and, and, and uh, the Sharks dogs and, and the dogs that I see at the top level, 
these Malinois have nerves that are as good as German she- any German Shepherd I've seen, don't you think? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Florian was just saying that a lot of people always say that um, the Malinois has worsened in its characteristics. Mm-hmm. Um, not our opinion, but obviously yeah. um, breed selection is important to ke- mm-hmm. keep a breed um, stable. We were just reading about it. Breeds haven't existed for a long time and they're genetically not stable if they're not being selected very carefully. Mm-hmm. Or bred very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the important piece. So, I mean, that's what you're, that's really, if, if nothing else from canine sports, that's a huge piece to get people together on breeding the best dogs <laughs> for either a pet home, a working home, or a working dog that's going to go out and do search and rescue. It's going to do uh, drug detection. It's going to do bomb detection. It's going to do police work and all that stuff. You want, you really, there's no reason not to want the best dog for the job. Yeah. Yeah. And when you talk to the various people who um, use their dogs in different situations, working environments, um, what a good dog means to them, Mm -hmm. generally you hear very similar things. Yeah, it's not that different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that goes through all the breeds, right? We all want stable dogs. We want a good temperament. We want a good, a confident dog. We want a genetically good dog. We want good nerves. Those are all things, whether you're looking for, you know, a border collie or a a, a raisin schnauzer, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I support the, the canine sports. I think it's a great organization. I think people throughout the world should sign up for it. I mean, it's, it sounds to me like it's a win-win. I mean, I hope you guys have Facebook where you're updating. Um, people can follow canine sports. Okay, I want to put that link below because I think it's important people put their name to it that they see what they can do to help out, um, to promote it, to get more pe- more signatures on board so that the governments really start to see that there is a united front in dog sports, we're taxpayers. We care about animals. We care about people, and um, you know. And it's time to listen to our voices too, because you know we're the rational ones here. I think more so than the other people. Yeah, um, as you said, we have Facebook and Instagram, um, but we also have a web um, site where we actually on the first page always update our progress, what we are currently doing and working on. Um, so information can be found there. And like we said before, there is an email address. So if somebody has a question or wants to get involved actively in any way, um, they can contact us and we will happily answer. Okay. I'm going to put all the, I'm going to have you send me it. I'm going to put all the links below Facebook, Instagram, and the website that everybody can get involved. And, um, you guys are doing amazing work. Um, I, I love your club. I mean, I'm very jealous that I'm not in Germany. I would love to be training with you. Um, but I, um, <clears throat> I support you and I hope we can kind of, I'd like to have this conversation a little bit more with, with you, Florian, about just the breeding and the genetics of the Malinois, because I talked to the girl who bred my dog, who's very, very knowledgeable, but more so from the herding and show line sides, I'd really like to get your input on the working line stuff and talk a little bit more about the, the CDP and the Kurung, um so people understand more about what really goes into the genetics of a really good Malinois. Of course, yeah, we should do it. We'll make it a future one. So great. I'm going to let you guys go. It's very late in Germany. I can't believe you're still awake. I would have fallen asleep by now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for doing this chat. Canine and sports. Um, let's, get, let's get everybody to support it. And um, let's talk soon, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Really fun.